They can't do it alone. Lend a hand to keep South Africa beautiful. We won't stop the magic at all. Daar is meer omgevingsnieuws en controversie vanavond in Kaat Blanche, wanneer Ruda en Derek onder andere verslag lever oor die slachting van Lewis, wat onlangs die grens oorgesteek het vanuit die Tuli Wildreservaat in Botswana. Dit en sommer nog baie meer vanavond slechts hier op Emnet in Kaat Blanche. En volgende aan die beurt een interessante kort insetsel oor die trek van Bome, een hele gedoente wat ontstaan het toe die Johannesburgse elektriciteitsafdeling onlangs besluit het om hulle 50 jaar oude palmbome saam te neem toe die departement verhuis. How many Johannesburg commuters travel this route daily? For them, this scene is as familiar as their dashboard. Take a good look at these palms, because next time you're on the M1 South, they won't be there. Johannesburg Electricity, whose head office has been in the grounds of the old power station for the last 50-odd years, are moving out. Lock, stock and palms. In April this year, the council decided, uh, took the decision to move the head office to Reuben Workshops. Uh, we've been at Reuven, as far as the central workshops are concerned, for the last eight, uh, more than eight years. And uh, in April this year, the council decided to, to move the head office from here to the Reuven workshops. All the staff are moving. What's happening to the palms? Like all long and loyal council servants, uh, we have to look after them and they're coming with us. It's part of our heritage, it's part of our tradition. It certainly is part of my life on this, on this site and we, uh, we must take them with. This photograph was taken between 1946 and 1948 and on closer inspection shows that some of the palm trees had already been planted, which 50 years later makes them fairly big and difficult to pack up and take with you. When in doubt, call in the experts. Jeremy Fowler certainly knew what route to take. Well, if one's moving a tree, it's really not that complicated. The trick is really just getting a big enough root ball, um, ensuring that there's a large enough root system to ensure the survival of the, the tree. With a palm, it's extremely easy. We don't have to tie in the soil to the roots. We don't have to create a root ball. One just simply digs it out, lifts it up, and moves the thing. As simple as that. Interesting bits and pieces were dug up during the tree freeing process. Not quite King Solomon's mines. And of course, no job of this magnitude can be without its Murphy's Law. Because the, 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 the palms are so close to the, to the building, the, the roots have gone under the foundation. And what they have, they've had problems with a lot of the, the services, fire, fire department services and cables, to get in to, to, uh, to cut the roots enabling them to crack the, the, the root mass as such and then to, to move the palm. Like any job, planning and preparation is vital and the trees had to be pruned back in order to prevent the leaves from dragging on the road and damaging the tree. Then, with the aid of a crane, these 10 to 15 ton monsters were gently lifted out of familiar ground and placed on a flatbed. An operation of this size involves many people, and the Johannesburg Traffic Department had to ensure that the trees would at least fit on the roads and under the bridges. Tree number two, and don't tell me, it's going on top of tree number one. Another quick consultation, and we're on our way.
No compost or nutrient of any kind was added to enrich the soil or prepare the hole. It turns out that any substance of this nature can in fact be harmful to the tree. The roots are like open wounds and run the risk of infection. All patted down and snugly put to bed for another 50 years. Two transplanted, only ten to go. We say hats off to the electricity department for caring enough about their trees that they took them with them. And if you thought those were big, you should have seen the Washingtonia robustus. Net voordat ons binnenkort door die kanaal van Kampioene aansluit voor de hele moedigse opwindende Daniel Beker Golf. In die laatste dagse spel rechtstreeks vanaf die St. Andrews Golfbaan in Skotland. Volg daar nou een gedeelte van ons vorige Camera 7 program wat natuurlijk gehandeld het oor die onlangse Oceanos ramp. So, blij dus ingeskakel en van my kant af geniet die rest van die middag en tot ziens. Good evening and welcome to Camera 7 coming to you this month from the Transkyan Wild Coast, bringing you this remarkable film footage shot by ship's entertainer, Moss Hills. And we talk to one of the many heroes. After the traumatic hours of conducting the rescue operation from the ship's bridge, Robin Boltman came ashore a few kilometers up the coast from here. There we join him and Anita Fisser at the Haven. As a 15-year-old boy, Robin Boltman had an ambition to be a magician. However, reality saw him working in a bank. Later, he did become an entertainer, practicing magic on various luxury liners, including the ill-fated Achille Laro. Robin was the somewhat reluctant hero who needed more than magic tricks to help save the lives of passengers on the sinking Oceanus. The first sign of any sort of trouble was when a, um, one of the Greek stewards came into the bar of the Four Seasons Lounge and asked Paniotis to come with him. I didn't understand what they said, of course, but Paniotis is a huge, big fellow. And I, my first thoughts were there was something wrong with one of the passengers, maybe he needed a bouncer or something to control him. And Paniotis stripped off his jacket and ran out of the bar. I called after him and said, anything, what's the matter? He said, no, it's okay. What he had done was he went down to the engine room to try and help them close the watertight doors that we now realize what was happening. I was busy putting some magic into my pockets and um, the lights went out, engine failure and you can just hear the sound of the sea. And the ship was at the mercy of the sea then with no engines, we've had no steerage. It was not the Greek ship's crew, according to Moss Hills, who told passengers the Oceanus was sinking. He had to find out for himself when he went below to find water was flooding the corridors and stairwells of the passenger decks. By that time, the crew had already packed their belongings and were waiting on deck. I'm right down below now. I'm actually on N deck, nearest desk deck. There's water everywhere. It looks like it's flowing in reasonably fast, but it's sloshing about from side to side. And it's now five minutes to one on the 4th of August. It must be Sunday today. So I guess we're going down. It's really hard to believe. That's the bottom of the stairway. At about 9.30 there was a power failure. Was there any signs of panic amongst the passengers at that stage? No, not at any stage actually. Right through the night there was no panic. A few kids were of course crying and um, when little kids can't understand a situation like that. And when doors and, and tables started uh, slamming shut and falling over, uh, glass, of course, as well, ashtrays, people, chairs, uh, a few of the kids started screaming. But uh, they were soon quietened down, uh, parents picking them up sort of thing. A woman in this lifeboat is reported to have been injured, her head gashed when a metal pulley crashed onto her from the deck above. <laughs> After a while they started falling apart and I'll tell you why they were being smashed against the side of the ship for ages, you know. Putting people on the lifeboat took quite a long time. I mean, some of them 
were in a lifeboat for half an hour, 45 minutes, just swinging on the side of the ship. I remember I told you that the ship was rolling. Um, the lifeboats come down and they are right alongside the ship. So that's when you're in still waters or at the docks. But when the ship is doing this, the lifeboat is swinging away from the ship for two to three meters and coming back, not gently either, coming back with the terrific smash to everything. And while this was happening, where were you and what were you doing? I was in the main lounge, um, chatting to the passengers, keeping them up to date, uh, basically keeping them calm. I got my guitar out. Uh, along with Moss and Tracy and uh, the two photographers, Stephanie and Kathy, and Linda, the shop manager there. And we were on the stage singing along with, with the passengers, trying to get them to sing. What was the mood like? The mood was quite sort of... There was no panic, but there was, they were uneasy, you know, with all the things falling over. We were tr trying to do our best in sort of like dim lighting, because we had emergency lights on, but the emergency lights are only in the lounges and um, the passageways, the gangways. Right, moving ahead, at one stage you had to actually go and man the control room, the radio control. Now, you've never done this in your life before. What happened? Uh, well, it wasn't sort of like I, I had to go and do it. All of our staff had been up there every now and again finding out the latest sort of news, how far the progress is going, uh, the evacuation process, that is. And Lorraine was up there, Julian was up there, Geraldine was up there. And after we'd moved the passengers out at about four in the morning, out of the main lounge to the off deck, you know, anticipating the sunrise, uh, SADF coming to our rescue. Um, all the passengers were out there and I went up to the bridge and um, there was nobody up there. And just a radio call saying, Oceana's coming, Oceana's coming. Frequency, can you help over? Uh, the question was, uh, National Sea Rescue need a spare channel. Uh, we on channel 16, channel 16 at the moment. Can you give a free channel? Over? Yes, of course. What channel do you want? Which one have you got? Did you at any stage have the feeling that you were utterly alone, that you were going to die? Um, when it became light again, oh no, just before, before daylight, before the helicopter started coming out to us, these thoughts did cross your mind. Would you ever see that one again? Would you ever see this one again? And whenever the ship is rolling and you're going through rough weather, you wonder how far you'll roll before you actually either roll over or rectify the roll. And when you're like lying at that angle, it was a bit of a strange feeling. You know, to each, um, like the staff members would look at each other in a serious roll, we'd look at each other and go, Do you think that there were people who, who were over, overwhelmed by fear, children, old people? A few people were, um, but generally the, the, the mood was strange because we kept on telling them that there's uh, ships out there. At daybreak we had seven ships on our, as neighbours right in the area um, with all the voices talking to us, even ships that were en route that would only get to us around about two o'clock in the afternoon, which would have been too late. They kept us, well, my spirits up anyway, and I relayed this onto uh, passengers that were downstairs being airlifted off. What about the allegations of, of the captain forsaking his ship? When did he leave? Did you see him leave? I didn't see him leave because at that stage I was on the bridge manning the radios and keeping in contact. Um, according to the, the team, the gang, um, they, he left in the first when the first airlifting started, that's when the captain went away. At what stage? What time was this? It was just after the so, um, daybreak, just after that. First light, should I say. When the helicopters came out, once we had cut the cables uh, so that it didn't hinder any of the airlifting, the airlifting began. And if he came to the haven and apparently he clocked in here and he was the seventh, there must have still been about more than 160 people out there on the ship still. And fixing the cable, did you go up on your own to fix it? Um, I, went, I climbed up the funnel to get the forward one. I wasn't, uh, con well, I'm not concerned, but I wasn't at the, the back action. There was other people at the aft section of the ship, at the pool deck. And what and happened? Did it hamper the rescue operation? It would have. We were tilting an angle, and also with the helicopters, um, those chopper pilots that were flying in that wind were really excellent. But to, um, to actually pull somebody out of the, off the ship, 
We had the steel cable going down the center of the ship for decorative purposes. It's got all the little colored lights on and that sort of thing. It looks great in the harbor at night, but um, when there's air lifting to be done, it could get in the way. While the captain got a lot of criticism, the South African Navy and Air Force got a lot of praise. Would you go along with this? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, not just the Navy and the Air Force, the Army as well, the, all the medics. Uh, as a SADF combined uh, exercise, they were really outstanding. Uh, for the last, what, 270 odd that they airlifted off, it was wonderful. And also the timing was sort of um, pretty crucial then because it was down to the last two or three hours of the ship's life. Throughout the whole story, in all the newspaper reports, everybody mentions how calm everybody was, you yourself included. Uh, did you have any sense of, of aftershock? There was a bit of um, delayed shock from some people. Uh, a couple of people went quiet. This is Hui Morris, South Africa. Delay the miss is also the open on the crack. When you stayed on the ship and you were helping with the controls and, and standing at the radio, at one stage, just before you were about to be lifted off, you went down and you got the canary. Why this? I just saw the little thing in its cage that was behind in the chart room. Normally during the day when it's, when it's lovely weather, the captain used to bring them out on the bridge uh, in the sheltered side and they used to sit there twittering. And, but then to see him in, sort of stuck inside the chart room, um, I just let him out the cage and he flew around the bridge. I actually thought of taking it up with me in the helicopter, but those little things, their heart is only that big. It would have died of fright going up there. As you were being airlifted into the helicopter and you got inside, what was the feeling? It was just a case of like trying to look out the window and see how far the ship is. And it was, we had been on the ship all the time. We hadn't seen it from the outside, like the rest of South Africa had been watching it all the time on the news. Have you since had dreams about what happened? Oh, yes. A few of us had a lot, uh, quite a lot of dreams. I've had uh, quite a few, uh, sort of just like sitting on the ship, asking uh, your friends that were on board with you at the time, saying, what are we doing here? You know, it's, it's a strange sort of sensation when you wake up and you, although nothing, it wasn't nightmares, uh, it was just like a case of dreaming that you're on the ship again. The man standing behind the woman in green, according to one survivor, is believed to be the captain. The chief radio officer is sitting on the right of the small group. With Robin Boltman coordinating the rescue on the ship's radio on the bridge, Moss Hills came here on at least five occasions to discuss the rescue and radio conversations with the captain. He, the captain, is reported to have subsequently claimed the radio was not working at this time. The captain and the radio officer waited here with the passengers to be rescued while the entertainers and others helped save their lives. He's been judged very harshly, the captain. When you came back to the haven, uh, you walked up to him. What was his reaction? Well, I told him that um, I was sorry about his ship. I shook hands with him. I said, sorry about your ship. And I had his jacket as well. I took his jacket off the bridge. I gave him his jacket back. And I told him I'd let the canary out the cage. And he had tears coming down his cheeks. You can imagine a guy like that. It was his home. A lot of criticism was also leveled by family waiting for relatives and friends uh, off the ship of information here that was handled badly on the ground. Apparently TFC wasn't that good in, in letting people know where their relatives were and they were sort of told to wait and they were given the brush off. Is that uh, true? No, it was very difficult. You know, those TFC girls had set up office uh, from Saturday night into Sunday morning early in Randburg uh, as a sort of crisis centre. Then they moved to the SAA buildings at the airport. They can imagine everybody was phoning. They were trying to, I mean, they phoned my parents in the, during the night, uh, during the Sunday morning. Uh, Diane phoned my mom and said, we don't want you to turn on your television or radio in the morning to find out about this. should be telling you now it's taking on water. Don't move until you have been counted by two people. Those of you at the back, you're making life a little difficult for us. If you wouldn't mind moving across to the pool area, please, so that we can get an accurate count. While you were one of the last to actually leave the ship, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind while you were waiting to be airlifted? What I was going to do when I got back on land. It was like now, I, I'm, I say I'm five weeks old. You know, you get a new lease of life. 
And um, I was just thinking what I'd do when I get off. Um, you're also thinking, because I had a bit of time to think on the bridge other than just talking on the radio. You're thinking, like, how are you going to start again? Because you know everything is going to go down on the ship. And there he is, our hero. This is Moss Hills. The man has shot all the home video you've been watching. Moss, you bloody skellum. The hero, baby. Absolute hero. At this point, the strain of Moss's efforts in the rescue became too much, and he collapsed from exhaustion. While lying here, he had to be prevented from getting up to help other survivors from the Oceanus. I'm just glad to see you. Anita Fisser, camera seven. The Haven.